Oh, good morning, um, Dr. Haas and Stephen uh, and Mark. Uh, is um, Tucker going to be with us as well, or do you know? Yes, he is coming, Senator. Yes. Good morning. Yeah. Um, good to see you. I think um, you folks know everybody. Uh, uh, so um, we can uh, get started. Um, the issue that uh, we wanted to, I guess, chat about um, and learn a little more about uh, was the um, issue from last week and kind of kept getting into it uh, over the weekend to some degree. I uh, was in regards to the difference between um, maple testing requirements in Vermont and versus uh, federal regs on testing. And I, I think that we would be interested in knowing a little bit about that history of, of, of change uh, when, uh, when we did it or when it happened uh, and, and what, what the difference is. I know it's very small, and but in layman's terms, you know what that difference really is. Um, so I, I don't know if who wants to to lead off on that, um, Kristen. Or I mean, you're the boss, so we'll pick on <laughs> you. I guess. But if, no, do it. Do it any way you'd like, uh, Kristen. Uh, yeah, if Steve knows about it or however you want to do it. Thank you, Senator Starr, and appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and your committee uh, regarding one of our one of Vermont's great products. So this is an exciting topic. Uh, and uh, for the record, my name is Kristen Haas, uh, Agency of Agriculture, Director of Food Safety and Consumer Protection. Um, and actually, Steve, not, not to put you on the spot, but I know you've done some research on the history of the current regulatory framework. I'm happy to reiterate what you have shared with me, but perhaps uh, since <laughs> you are the source of that research, may I ask you to provide an overview and that way it's straight from the, straight from the sources mouth, so to speak? Yes, but I just came because I love to hear about maple. So that's not really fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. So we probably all the members of the committee know we lost a lot of our institutional historical knowledge that we had when Henry Marcus uh, retired. So he was a longtime expert and I'm sure could have easily given you an exact explanation for the density requirements, but we, um, we did look, I did do some statutory research and some rule research, and I wasn't, I didn't have a lot of time to find anything definitive, but it is clear to me that at least, at least since 1981, the statute has allowed the agency to, to by rule regulate density. And before that, it looked like, and I couldn't, the, the annotated statutes that are that I can find online only go back to 1989. So I couldn't find the 1981 version it, itself, but it looks to me like that statutory rubric in 1981 replaced a law that was adopted in 1947. So I don't, we don't really know exactly how long the density standards go back, but we know that we've been able to regulate density since at least 1981. Now the current rule that's in effect has been in effect since 1990. I don't know if there was a rule that preceded it. I assume there was, but I'm not certain. And I couldn't find the 1990 version of the rule online. I'm sure it exists, but it wasn't available online. The 1990 rule though is the current rule and it was amended in 2005 and again in 2014. So in 2000, in you're on, I'm sorry, Senator Starr, you're on mute. It, if it was changed or altered, uh, yeah, explain that a little bit, Steve. 
Well, so we, we think, and this is from the institutional knowledge that we still have, um, which is not Henry, but others, we think that it has not changed since 1990. So we think the standards have been the same, but, but we're not positive. But what I can tell you is that the current standard has definitely been in effect since at least 2005. Because I have the 2005 rule and those density requirements are identical to what they are today. So we know it's been at least 16 years, but we think from talking to people in the agency who, who have dealt with density that they've been in effect even longer. And since the rule was adopted in 1990 and there were no changes between 1990 and 2005, we believe the density standards have been in effect since at least 1990. And so this is nothing new, I guess, is, is the point. But we do, have a higher, we do have a higher sugar content than the USDA requires. And one other interesting sidelight is that that issue was squarely addressed in 2014. So when we amended the rule in 2014, there's an introductory paragraph to that rule amendment. And, and density was not changed at all. But in that introductory paragraph, the agency made explicit that it was retaining the higher density standard because it to promote the, the Vermont maple flavor, essentially. So there's a belief, and, and we think it's probably true, that the higher sugar content creates a different flavor and a higher maple flavor. So whether or not that's scientifically true, I can't attest to, but, but we do know that the density issue was was discussed at least and an intentional decision was made in 2014 to leave the higher density standard in place because of this at minimum this different rep reputational benefit of of having the higher sugar content be the minimum does that make sense to everyone what i you know uh, uh yeah and uh, uh just a quick question uh when <clears throat> you speak about uh rule are you talking about a, a rule that goes through LCAR or a rule that you folks could change at the agency? Uh, I mean, how's that work, Steve? So, Senator, it's, it's by rule. And so it is, it is something we could change, but only by going through the APA process. And that's pursuant to, in, in our legislative authority, the, the legislature gave us that it gave it, it what it said, and this is in Section 487 of Title VI, is, and this was going back to at least 1981. The legislature said that the, the agency shall promulgate regulations for grading maple syrup, and that we may promulgate regulations for density. So, so that's at least since 1981, and we know that in the 1990 rule, we prom we have the basically the same standard since then. And, and we have created grades and density. So we've done that both through the APA process and to change that, we would have to go back through the APA, Senator. Yeah, uh, Senator Colmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Steve, do you know the last time that the federal standard and the Vermont standard were the <clears throat> same? So Senator, I tried to find that out <clears throat> in the current USDA standard was adopted in 2015. And that, so, so, and I did not find whether or not there was a standard before. And I, as I understand it, it's not even in statute. I think it's a voluntary marketing standard that USDA uses. So it's something that you don't, you don't have to comply with it at all. But if you're going to call it maple, then you have to meet that standard. But I did look at a, a journal that was published at some, I can't think of the name of it now, but it's sort of a famous maple sugar makers journal. And I think it was the 2013 copy. And in that journal, the only density standard that mentioned was, was Vermont standard. And it said all the hydrometers were in a tune to the Vermont standard. So I'm guessing, and this is a guess, and maybe others know that maybe there wasn't a USDA standard and, and that people sort of use Vermont's by default, but that is a guess. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mark, uh, Mark, do you know anything about that history uh, from the extensions point of view? Sure, thank you, Senator Starr. And uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Mark Isselhart, Maple Specialist with the University of Vermont Extension. So I'm an educator, uh, do research and, and support the maple industry in Vermont and elsewhere. Um, so there has been a USDA standard for a long time. 
okay. I don't have the exact date, but I, I would put it somewhere in the 1940s, um, somewhere in there. I'd be happy to share the reference I have for that. The, um, the alignment with Vermont standards, I, I believe the Vermont minimum density is, a, is close to 100 years old. I think it's been around for a very long time. And I do agree that it was set intentionally to provide, not to get too into the weeds, but a better mouthfeel, which would in turn produce better flavor, a better tasting product. True, you would also boil a little bit more to get more flavor. So it's a combination of the sensory and the production of syrup with a little more density would make it a better product. And my understanding is that the maple industry in Vermont um, was very intentional about that and, and chose to differentiate it. it. It's true that a lot of these regulations or uh, references are hard to find. And I, I know that there are some cabinets uh, both at UVM and, and at the agency that probably have the answers, but um, I'd be more than happy to dig through when I, when I can and, and provide the committee with any references I can find that aren't, aren't available online. Well, you know, I, we, uh, we all um, strongly support our maple industry and certainly, um, certainly want to make sure that our maple's the best in the world, not just here in Vermont uh, or in the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, there's reasons why it does taste better. And, and probably this density uh, uh, level, you know, uh, is there for that very reason. Um, the, I, I'm wondering, is there a, if, if a package is marked maple spread or maple candy, if the word maple is on there, uh, does that maple within, you know, they mix cream and other things in, does that maple have to test at a certain density level? Is that, am I understanding that correctly or? How, how does that work? So, Senator, I think probably Tucker or Dr. Haas could answer this better, but, I, but what I do know is that if, it's, if it says maple, it has to be a complete maple product. So it has to be, okay. you know, it has to be 100% from maple sap, boiled, nothing added. There is a grade A, there is grade A characterization, and then there's a processed characterization and I believe the density requirement for processed is lower. So I think the density requirement could be less for something used for maple flavoring, but Tucker or Dr. Haas might better answer that or, or Mark. Yep, um, one of you folks wanna take a crack at that? Tucker, would you be willing to hear the, you're the current agency subject matter expert on questions like this, so go for it. <laughs> that's sure. that's um, little, Tucker's little Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Tucker is, yeah. has been working very hard and has done a great job on making sure that things are as they should be out there. So yeah, he's a wealth of knowledge on this, as is Mark. Uh, yeah. so. I think he likes to be called yeah. Henry though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I feel lucky enough to to have received some training from Henry before he he retired. So, um, so to to answer your question, Senator, um, the density requirements relate only to maple grade A maple um, maple syrup. Um, there is a, a, a processing grade density for that, but when it comes to um, something like a maple candy or maple butter or maple cream, the density requirement doesn't, doesn't apply to those products. They're, they're going to be a, a much higher density as a, um, you know, not, not a liquid product. Um, yeah. yeah. So candy and spreads and all those things, lollipops and those things are, are different than the actual uh, fluid maple syrup. And, and 
what's the difference, Tucker, between the density level of our, our maple syrup compared to if you went to using a federal reg or bought some from a state that only used uh, the federal regulation? Um, yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Um, it's, it's fairly minimal. Um, there are two different metrics that are different scales that you can measure density by. Um, there's the BAME scale and then the BRICS scale. Um, you can think of these as um, it's similar to inches and centimeters where, you know, you've got two different scales, but they're, that you can make, um, you can use yeah. either, either is fine to use. Um, it's perhaps easiest if I put it in, in terms of the brick scale um, and compare it. Well, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that the temperature of the syrup when you're measuring it is important to that measurement. So you have to choose one of the scales and then also have, have a reference temperature. So it's easiest probably to make the comparison at the reference temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit and also using a brick 68. How many? 88? 68. 68, okay. Yeah. Thanks. So at, at 68 Fahrenheit, using the BRICS scale, the USDA standard is um, 66.0, and Vermont standard when you make the conversion is 66.5. Oh, so it's pretty small. And I mean, the difference is pretty close. And yeah, yep. So my, my next question would be, if, if it's so close, why, if I wanted to make maple, why would I, not go with the with the Vermont standard, especially living here in Vermont, rather than the federal standard. I mean, it, we're talk must be talking about pennies a gallon difference in cost or savings. Right. Um, I, I guess the simplest answer is that it, there is a cost savings, even though it's going to be small um but if you i guess it depends on how much you know syrup you're producing if you're producing you know gallons and gallons of syrup then that difference will be greater um based on the volume that you're selling but if you're a smaller producer it's that's going to be a pretty minimal difference yeah well i mean i I could figure that out. Uh, you know, uh, we have some some producers that do ten thousand gallons. Certainly, uh, the big one up in Island Pond, Vermont. I I can't even guess how many thousands of gallons they make. Um, so if if you were their size and could save a half a point, but that half a point is on 66. So in a gallon, you'd, hell, in a gallon, you'd be um, down down to maybe three, right? Point three. Uh, yeah, because you've got 30. If you took the degrees, can you ever change that to 100, uh, Tucker? so that you could calculate out the savings? Yeah, I, um, Is it Steve actually asked me to do some of this math beforehand. Um, so I, I, I did try and, and, and make that calculation. And if I, if I did it correctly, it, it equates to um, less than 1% yeah. uh, difference. Well, five, if you point, take 0.5, and use the 66, you, you know, you're down there pretty darn low. 
And yeah. um, so, it's, <laughs> yeah, that's that's splitting pennies, I would say. Um, but anyway, uh, questions from the committee uh, in regards to this whole discussion. Um, so um, the uh, so we're talking about a very slight difference between the federal level and our state level. And the I guess the next question is how have you do you ever get any requests uh, like for from the feds to do any testing for them or do they have anybody that even goes around and checks maple at all or maybe at imports or if you're exporting or or something is there any knowledge about about that no I was, Senator, I was just going to say that I'm I'm not aware in the 14 years that I've been with the agency of of that being a program that um, that is ongoing out there. Um, we used to when there was a, a demand for it, um, our team under Henry Marcus's guidance um, used to do periodic inspections and grading of bulk uh, containers of maple for for the private sector and, and we would charge a fee for service for that. Um, so that activity went on, not that that is, I realize that's different than what you're asking about, but I just mentioned it as a additional sort of scope of work that we used to do, but then that demand dried up and, and so we haven't done that in, in quite some time. But Mark, maybe you <laughs> maybe you have history on this. Well, yeah. I, I'll say that the, the the only federal presence I'm aware of is through inspections of sugar houses related to FSMA, which is food safety. It's not syrup quality. And my understanding, and there have been sugar houses in Vermont that have been inspected by FDA um, consistently. Not a huge amount, but enough to, to get folks' attention. But again, this is based on food safety. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily be checking syrup density um, yeah. as, as a matter of, as a matter of course, what this might be a, just a historical artifact, but I believe that the reason why the, the Vermont law is what it is, is because that bomb a scale was the dominant scale at the time. And that range goes from 36 to 37 bomb a. And in, if you look at the Vermont statute, it still says bomb a, and then bricks is sort of in parentheses. So I think we might be looking at as a, a fairly old um, artifact that the other industries, uh, the other states and in, in the federal law just, just didn't use BAME. It wasn't, and they were relatively late. You know, Vermont was early in adopting maple regulations compared to the federal. So um, that's, my, that's my perspective. Yeah, well, you know, Vermont, Vermonters and, you know, farmers that, Actually, farmers were the first ones, I, I would say, that really, you know, did in the spring, you automatically tapped what maples you had, could and, and made maple syrup to, to, you know, for your family and to sell to make a little money. Um, I know, I know I had plenty of years <laughs> growing up when in the late fall, you'd You'd after you, the wood and all that was put away, you'd do Christmas trees and then you had a little time off, but then you'd get ready for sugaring in the spring and, and just a constant uh, one job to the next to the next. Um, but, um, you know, I think over, over the years, um, our maple sugar. Makers Association, along, of course, with all their members, have done a, a good job of promoting a excellent product. And, and um, I would expect that, that uh, you know, some of them older folk, well, our forefathers pushed this stuff along to, to stay, a, you know, a little bit ahead of the rest of the pack. And and uh, the uh, but the issue that 
we wanted to get clarified. Um, uh, one of our, or a couple of our fellow senators were asking questions in, in regards to, and, and uh, so they mentioned it to me and I felt that we should, we should look into this to see, you know, what the difference is and, and what the cost difference could add up to or, or uh, but it's a pretty minute uh, issue, I think. Uh, Senator Colmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm really blown away by the fact that 0.6 degrees, and I realize this is a pretty subjective kind of evaluation. It's kind of like who has the best apples in the country? Well, I guess that depends on who you ask and who has the best corn tasting products. Um, but anyway, I'm glad that we do, and I really do think we do, but I'm just absolutely amazed that it comes down to such a, it's not infinitesimal, but it's a pretty darn small uh, difference. And congratulations to the sugar makers for promoting it and being able to market it as this obviously better product. I mean, I'm not sure I can tell. If you gave me something from New York State or something from Vermont that I'd be able to say, that's definitely better tasting maple and that must be because it's from Vermont. So it's pretty amazing. And thank you all for coming in because this is uh, this is pretty interesting stuff to me. Well, I I doubt, Colomar, if you could tell because you live too close to New York and I'm probably already getting some of that cheaper syrup anyways. Mr. Chair, I only buy Vermont maple syrup. <laughs> um, um, any... Any other uh, questions um, from from the committee, or do any of you have anything else you'd like to um, to express or offer? Uh, and Senator Starr, um, I, I would also add for your committee's additional context or awareness, if if anyone is interested, and I can send the link to Linda or whatever your preference is on that front, but on our website. Um, Tucker has done a really nice job of, of making available to the general public and to you all, um, if you so choose, uh, so a summary um, from the 2020 uh, inspections, retail maple inspections that he completed, as well as a, a quite detailed inspection protocol, such that if anyone were to have questions about, hey, what is what does Tucker do when he goes into Hannaford or to the co-op and, and goes to inspect a lot of maple syrup? It, it spells that out. So I, if that would be of interest to you, it is available on our website and we intend um, to do the same thing at the conclusion of the 2021, this year's uh, maple, maple inspections, just to help inform the industry as well as consumers of sort of the generic set of findings. We, we don't highlight any individual business findings or producer findings, but instead um, capture that data in a, in a quantitative, yeah, quantitative format and um, post it so that people can have an idea of what those findings are. So I, I can send Linda the, the web link if you would like or send it directly to you, Senator Starr. Uh, just send it to our, our you know, web link uh, for Linda and then she'll get it to all of us. Okay. And you know, I, I thought you were going to announce uh, that you were going to have the Maple Festival and <laughs> then you come out with all this stuff. I mean, we could have been going to a party if you'd announced the Maple Festival was on. I am as You're ready as... You're welcome to come up. <laughs> yeah. they, they sent out an email today of, of revised... But we love the Maple Festival. My mom ran the parade there for like 10 or 15 years. Are they going to do it or no? No, not, they're going to do something, but not the traditional. Yeah, that's really quite a, quite a shindig. Um, yeah. Okay, if I can add Eddie, one thing. Uh, it, yes, Mark. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Senator. Um, I do want to just say, even though the number, the absolute number in difference in density is small, um, there is a difference in mouthfeel, and I think it's important for folks to recognize if you grade syrup at contests like at the Maple Festival and you taste hundreds of samples, um, there is a difference. And, and so the viscosity 
it's different. It's not a linear relationship. So when you get little differences in density at syrup level, it can make a difference. So I, I appreciate the small number in, in units, but it can have an effect in the sensory perception of, of syrup. And I know that's pretty far in the weeds, but I, I, it is, it is, there is an effect there, um, I, I could say. A positive effect I would take. Right. For sure, yeah, for yeah. sure. And and the other thing to point out is that the regulation has a range of from 66.9 to 68.9 bricks. So there is a pretty broad range that's acceptable for density in syrup. Um, and we're talking at the low end, but there is there is a range on the high end as well. So um, it's it's not a one point that bullseye they have to hit as far as meeting the standard. Sure. So there is some leeway in there. Um, uh, Steve? Thank you, Senator Starr. I just wanted to add that the, it's our experience that the maple sugar producers are very interested in this standard as well. And as, as recently as 2019, they were telling us about their desire to have this enforced because they do. And, and I think there's a good amount of advertising that they and others do that touts the higher standard. and. And in terms of the viscosity difference, and to Senator Collimore's point, there is a, apparently a, a notable difference, and I'll be happy to taste test to find out. But but in Tucker's calculation, the the amount of sap is really pretty minuscule for that difference in density. And so, if Tucker's calculated what for the average of when the sugar content is at average, and it takes about forty gallons to to boil uh, of sap to boil one gallon of syrup, it's only about 0 0.3 gallons more sap to, to reach the Vermont standard. So that's really, you know, in terms of the economic differential, it seems pretty minuscule for the, for retaining that advantage that, that producers have kind of fought for, I think. I'll say that this, this committee was lucky enough to uh, at one time have uh, former legislator Carol Brannigan on it. And then we used to have Harvey Smith from the House Ag <laughs> Committee come in and they both had sugar made, uh, they both made sugar. And I could taste the difference between the two. And there, there was a contest about who was better and all that kind of stuff. Seems like there was a maybe a third or fourth person involved too, but I don't remember. Yeah, Carol and always won, I think. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Of course she kept us supplied with that. Yes, all she did. Season long. We were <laughs> we a little kinda... biased there, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, you think about, you think about this whole issue. Um, if I'm a syrup maker and and um, Dave Marvin wants to come along and buys my syrup, he's going to get syrup that should test a six point six, right? And then if if he takes and does whatever he does to it and sells it for and so it cuts it down to, um, to just 66 instead of 6.5. He's the one that's making the money on it, isn't the sugar maker? Because we all, we all are at the same standard. And usually, as far as I know, other than the grade, if you meet the certain grades, you get paid the same price if you're from Franklin County or from Orleans County. So, um, you know, if somebody's gonna make some money by diluting this, it really isn't quite right. Uh, so, um, but anyways, um, anything else from any of you folks? If, uh, just, if oh. not, uh, Mark, did, did you have well, I just wanted to say that there is actually a differentiation for bulk syrup being sold. It's actually a lower minimum density for bulk syrup. Uh, I believe it's 65.9. Um, to, your, to your point about um, a producer would be advantageous to meet so as not to lose any if they sold it in bulk, which close to 90% of Vermont syrup is sold in bulk now. That's changed in the last I would say in the last 30, 40 years, it's gone from about roughly 50, 50 to now close to 90%. So, but there is a differentiation for, for bulk syrup. Is, is that 
reason that because of the volume that we make has increased, but yet our population and people eating um, maple is hasn't grown a whole heck of a lot. It, is that why it moved uh, up to quite? Well, we haven't done a whole lot of research to, to understand why, but I think the best explanation is that the big growth we've seen in the industry in the last 20, 25 years has been yeah. in the larger sized operations. Yeah. And it's very difficult to market syrup retail. It takes a lot of money and time. And I think a lot of those producers are content and have developed businesses that can be successful, but selling to a, a packer. Um, that's, my, that's my understanding. Yeah. Um, any other questions, statements? Um, if not, uh, you know, thanks a lot folks for coming in and and uh, this is very helpful and we'll uh, we'll pass the word around that we looked into it and and uh, and I think people will appreciate that so good enough and uh, so we, thanks again and we'll uh, we'll see you sometime along Thank, thank you so you. much for having us. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. I've enjoyed being surrounded by experts. It's been an easy gig for me. So this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Take care. Well, the boss, as long as you have good help, you don't need to know everything. Just hire good help. <laughs> yeah, take care, folks. Take care. Uh, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, so, uh, committee, um, I don't know if um, if we got uh, if if we had any of our folks from yesterday come back today or or not. Gail, have we got anybody in the uh, waiting room? There is no one in the waiting room right, right now. Yeah, um, I did see so an email I, from Graham, Mr. Chair. He sent it about. Oh, 10.20 this morning. Yeah. Uh, what, what did he, he sent an email, Brian? Yeah, he sent it to everybody. We're sincerely grateful for your willingness to take testimony on S25. We offer here some bullet points about making cannabis, cannabis an agricultural product and look forward to chatting with you again. So. My guess is that they will be coming in. Um, well, I didn't I mention that we would try to work them back in today? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, but I, I think I did tell them 11, right around yeah. 11. You did. Uh, did. Did you folks get your... Um, did you get copies of what um, what we uh, received uh, from Michelle? No, no. I think and, only you got it, or you and Chris, maybe. Yeah. You want me to forward uh, it? Well, well yeah. because, because what we got from Graham is pretty long and involved. I mean, it's like a uh, whole discussion. I mean, I think that what we were hoping to get from Michelle was something kind of short and direct. That we we did. <laughs> yeah. Could you do that, Chris? Because um, I doubt if Gail has that. No, I don't. Yeah. So um, it, it is short. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, you know, it, it's pretty yep. short. And there's only either two items in that language or three that. I, that I think that we might be interested in uh, chatting about. And see. we don't want to, you go and load a, a whole pickup load up, Sears going to throw it, back it up to the dump and dump it. You send him something that he can use, he may, you know, simple and short and direct, uh, we might, we might, you know, get it added in. 
Um, so I, I just sent you the language uh, and I'm trying to open it up now. Senator Pearson, did you include Linda in that? Uh, no, uh, but I will send it to her and to you right now. Should this be posted on the committee page, Senator Starr? Um, not really. Okay. Not, I mean, we, we're going to talk about it first and see if, you know, if the committee wants to do it once we chat about it, fine. But this is just for our discussion purposes for the purpose of, of, of following through on our, the request of the chair of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee that he wanted us to look at the ag part of of the uh, cannabis bill. I'm not sure what you have, Mr. Chair, but what Chris said is two pages long. Yeah. Well, it, but isn't the isn't the bulk of it on this very first page where it raises raises the minimum or, or the small guys from 1,000 to 1,500 square feet yep. and then yep. down and it shall down a couple of lines cultivator licenses and shall include production limits and then down in B at near the bottom at um, the largest uh, yep. maximum size would be 10,000 square feet. 30,000. 30, You're looking at the first draft, Bobby. Yeah, I thought it was 10 too. Well, also, that's what it is now, I think. No, we have no limit now. Um, um, the, 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 we have talked in the past about 10,000. <clears> the suggestion from some of the folks yesterday was 10,000. Um, but that seemed very small to me. Uh, and, you know, I, but I'll confess, I don't really have a clue. What it's I, a quarter of an acre, Chris. Yeah. So, you I know, mean, you know, 20 by 50. As the cap, the biggest. So, so here, here's where I thought through, and this is why I landed at 30,000. In Massachusetts, the smallest level is 5,000 square feet. We're proposing going from 1,000 to 1,500. So that's about a third of, of what Massachusetts does. In Massachusetts, the cap is 100,000 square feet. Oh, it's what, two, two acres. Yeah, two, two, two and a half two. acres. That's big. So I I decide to stick with the third of Massachusetts. So so both of them are scaled to about a third of Massachusetts. So thirty thousand square feet. That's not even an acre. It's about two thirds of three an acre. quarters. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's an acre? Forty three thousand. Forty two, forty three. Depends on who's running the ruler. Yeah. So anyway, I, I mean. I'm open to discussing it, but it just, this does not seem to me to be a, a runaway operation here. Um, we, we need, you know, if anything, there's a risk in other states, <laughs> excuse me, of running out of product. So I don't know. Anyway, that's the logic. We just went on both le levels with about a third of what Massachusetts is permitted. Um, see, like, if you went to the 30,000 square feet, that would that be indoor, Chris, or outdoor? Because you could build a building over that if you know if you wanted, uh, yeah. you know, without a whole lot of cost. Um, About a third of what Massachusetts is per. It's silent on indoor outdoor. Uh, and even on the small end, it's silent, right? But Gail, Gail had a question, Bobby. Who? Gail. Oh, oh, that's that's all right. I was just going to let you know that the witnesses have joined us. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. 
Yeah, you can let them in. Anyway, I mean, the I'm reminded that one of the challenges here is the premise in the law has been that we're charging the board to kind of figure out roughly how much they think we need and therefore how many permits and what kind of permits are needed to achieve the volume of the expected business. Um, and in, in historically over the last many years, the legislature has tried to come up with, you know, you should have this many small permits, this many medium, this many big. And as it was advancing, I think that the, the the feeling was the board will figure out the lay of the land. They'll figure out, therefore, how many permits in each category and the fees that will go along with it. Because after all, you need the fees to raise the money to handle it. And, and, and so the risk that we have here is that disconnect between all of those moving parts if we're injecting ourselves. So anyway... Um, trying to come up with some logic, I just went with a third of what they're doing in Massachusetts, figuring that we would want to have a smaller scale than our neighbors to the south. And one hour both on both ends, are, do they have a top end on theirs too, Chris? Yeah, 100,000 square feet. Yeah, so... We went a, a third on the low end and a third on the upper end. No. We went a third of theirs on both of ours. So that put us at 1,500 on the low end and 30,000 square feet on the upper end, maximum size. So, and is there, have, have you looked at the board would determine how many of each of those is, is allowed? So that, that's, that's my understanding of the, of the law. Yes. Already. So you could, if you hung back and didn't get, didn't get in, you could be excluded from participating because the board could feel that the market is full. Is, am, am I stating that right? Well, uh, they, they wouldn't they, issue you a license. If, if the market was full and I'm a year or two behind of, of applying and, and getting in, the board, if everything was full, the board could regulate the supply of that of that product or of the growers that are supplying the market. As far as I understand it, yeah. Yeah, yeah and we're not addressing that here. We're, no. We're, if anything, we're making it probably more likely that more businesses come in because we're, we're making sure that Although at the small end, we're making them bigger. So it's hard to know, but. No, but I think overall, Chris, you're right. It, we're, we're clearly favoring smaller enterprises. But heck, uh, if you had a plot that was 10,000 square feet, I mean, you aren't going to be able to have more than eight or 10 plants. I mean, those things really get bushy, uh, you know, I thought they had to have like six feet or something around them, you know, to have a row down through a, to, you know, a pathway and uh, you aren't gonna have many plants on, on uh, 10,000 square feet. So it, anyway. Uh, I mean, I mean it, it's impossible to know entirely what, what we're saying here is there's an entry level, a, a craft level that's a little bit easier to get into, requires less capital. So it's presumably easier for, for you know, different kinds of folks to get in, BIPOC and others. 
we give them a head start in the in the structure in terms of the timing so that the the hope has always been that that gives them an entry into the market not just that they can be up and running but that they actually can sell their product and create some business relationships that are meaningful you know um there's not a lot of guarantees here but that is the the vision no. that's farming there's no guarantees yeah. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of our vegetable growers would like this kind of uh, uh, yeah. timeline advantage, but we could say we could say the vegetable growers of Franklin County can start selling their vegetables uh, three months ahead of Chittenden County. See if that would help. Well, them. they we probably don't call will, farmers to call them gardeners. They'll probably <laughs> cross pollinate their carrots with a little cannabis and. Say, hey, I've got some carrots that'll spike you up here. <laughs> um, Calm me down. Anyway. I think it works the other way, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, so, guys, uh, we've got uh, uh, Jeffrey and, and Josh back. I don't know Maddie's with us. I don't know if Graham's with us or not, but uh, good to see you guys back. Um, we, um, we did get a, a change, uh, some changes done to the bill uh, that uh, I don't know if, if you, have you guys been in so you could hear us chatting or did you just get in? Um, I've been in for a few minutes, but I think it might be helpful if you're willing to just share uh, the language that you're looking at either verbally or otherwise, because we don't have access to that. So it's hard to know what you're referring to. Well, that's just as well. It's better if you don't see it. <laughs> as you know, you know, we've also submitted some of our own, so we're happy to just <laughs> look at that. <laughs> um, well, I, Gail, did you get a copy of that? Chris sent. I did, Mr. Chair. Is that something that that you could pull up on the screen? Uh, that I don't know how deep we. I think Chris, did you have those changes on the first page made so we can use? Just the little section, or do we need to have? Uh, I think I think it got a little longer because in talking to Michelle, she remembered she had to loop in the current oh. use piece. Um, you can't just change it in the amounts, but you also have to change it in the permission for current use. So, um, so I think that's why the 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 second go around was a little longer, Bobby. But yeah. I, I could email it or Gail could, it'd probably be easiest just to post it to the website, I think, and that way. Yeah, would... then you guys could pull it up, right, uh, Maddie? Yeah, that so would be your star. Uh, I will have to, um, I don't have access to your page, so let me notify Linda. And in the meantime, why don't I put it on my screen to share? Um, yeah. Okay. And, but basically, uh, what what we have gotten done so far is, you know, yesterday we talked about uh, the uh, the small growers uh, being um, being capped out. Uh, if you go over to uh, page two, we increased that number from. Uh, a thousand square feet to fifteen hundred square feet, uh, so that our small craft people, uh, you know, could grow a little bit larger crop, uh, and um, and you know, even fifteen hundred feet is um, what's that? A little strip thirty by fifty, uh, you know, which is is not very big. I don't know. We were talking before you folks came on about how much room a, a plant actually has to have and and keep it separated from from the next plant. Uh, but I know I I've looked at some hemp fields and it seems like they're they've got to be at least four or six feet apart. I is 
Is cannabis a plant? Do any of you know how much room you need for a cannabis plant? I can take that uh, chair start and thanks for asking. Um, and good to see everybody again. Uh, good morning, almost good afternoon. Yes, uh, indoor considerably less space is needed. Um, we're talking a foot to two feet, maybe uh, three feet max. I wanna say indoor, whereas outdoor, yes. The spacing would be anywhere from, we had said uh, nine to 15 feet, which of course would uh, uh, preclude you know, uh, smaller uh, plots, but larger plots with larger plants uh, need more spacing. So you're right, uh, you know, five, 10, 15 feet for outdoor. Indoor, not so much, a foot to two feet. So could you use, um, say, you know, you go tell somebody a foot or two, I mean, hey, we're better off to use the larger number if we can. Uh, you know, not that that would be in the, any rules or laws, but it would, for the people that are skeptical about the whole situation, uh, it would seem to me if we use the maximum footage, it would, it would certainly sell those people um, on the idea, well, this isn't too bad. So could you use um, three feet uh, indoors and I mean, just roughly thinking uh, mm -hmm. in maybe six, see, we didn't differentiate between inside and outside. We've left, we've left that language sort of alone. Uh, Chris? Well, Bobby, I, I, I went around and around with Michelle on this. Um, because as I've said, I would love to find us a way to be encouraging outdoor growth. growth. Um, it was hard. And as soon as you touch it in one place, you know, suddenly we're not looking at a two page thing. We're sending Sears quite a complicated um, situation. So, you know, given that we've had a half a day to deal with this, I'll just be honest and say, I tried to figure it out and we couldn't. Um, I'm not, I'm certainly very uh, supportive of us doing that. Um, but it is, um, you know, especially now that we're limiting or we're, we're putting numbers down, do we mean those to be outdoor numbers or indoor numbers? We, we would have to make some decisions and, and, and I'm not, you know, I was also trying to say to Michelle, well, just direct the board. They can figure out different tiers based if it's indoor or outdoor. She sort of thought that they could already do that. Massachusetts, they delineate that way along with the fees, but not with the tier. So, so there's, it's cheaper if you're going to be outside reflecting that you're less resource intensive, I guess. But anyway, it's complicated. What can I tell you? Uh, and I failed to do it. And, and I'm sure people have ideas of how we could do it. I do as well. But it will not be, uh, you know, a short memo if we if we try to craft those solutions. Oh, I think we're better off to leave it vague. Uh, um, if you go outside, you're going to grow bigger plants. But if you've got 1500 feet instead of 1000, you should, shouldn't you still be able, a small craft grower, cultivator, wouldn't he be able to still make a buck or two if we could get rid of this product? You guys, if I, do you? If I may, Senator, I can quickly speak. This is Graham Unings from Phenox, Policy Director at Rural Vermont. And sorry if you hear a little noise in the background. I have my 11 month old daughter with me. Um, but this is, there is language in the bill currently around, you know, what the number of square feet, the thousand square foot rule. And it doesn't, as you said, distinguish between indoor and outdoor. And that is what we find extremely problematic um, because assuming it goes to the CCB and as we're saying, they can make all these distinctions. If it's legislatively mandated that the lowest license is a thousand square feet, then they can't, for example, say, well, for outdoor, like outdoor growing, the smallest license should be 4,000 square feet. And that's what our point is. We've, we've recommended that the, lar the, the small craft here for outdoor would be 4,000 and the small craft here for indoor would be 
1,000. So the reasons that Jeffrey just mentioned, as well as the crop loss that Joshua talked about yesterday and just all of, all of those things. And I'll pass it over to Jeffrey or Joshua to respond more. I, I just uh, want to quickly, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. oh I, I just wanted to add, um, if you don't uh, mind, Josh, go after me, um, Chair Starr. And I appreciate the concerns you bring up, Senator Pearson. Um, I echo uh, the, the, the urgency though of my colleague and I, I wanna provide some context here. Um, these are uh, simplifications of the law by uh, inserting a, a four to two to one ratio. We provide, we think it provides clarity where there is currently uncertainty for farmers and small businesses. And we are not plucking this out of thin air. These are firm uh, precedent that you find in agrarian states, Northern California, parts of Oregon. You may not see it necessarily in Massachusetts. You'll see it in Maine where they have, like Vermont, a larger agricultural community, they embrace these simplified standards out of the gate using legislation. Um, I just want to provide that context. Sorry, Josh. No, thank you. Um, I also, for, for further context, a few other things to think about with the difference between outdoor and indoor and mixed light growing. Outdoor growing, you're only getting one harvest per year. So while your plants may be larger and you, you may be getting more product, you're banking on one harvest, maybe two if you're doing light, light deprivation in a, in a mixed light situation, but you need to have a greenhouse in order to, to, to do that process. Whereas indoor, you can rotate harvests through separate rooms and have more steady supply through the season. Also in terms of price per pound, indoor product is generally regarded as higher quality. So while it's much more expensive to invest in an indoor grow, the, the, you know, the, the poundage that you get is worth more on a weight, uh, on a weight basis than if you were growing outdoors. So, you know, these are some of the dynamics here that, that definitely need to be taken into consideration. And while I agree, it does get, it, it can get complex uh, if, it, if that gets too narrowly defined at a broad level, distinguishing outdoor mixed light and indoor differentiation uh, on the basis of size of grow or anything like that, I think it can be a pretty straightforward exercise. And I think the language that we provided in bullet point form uh, is relatively simple. So uh, just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I would just echo um, what everyone said. And um, I'd be interested to know maybe a little bit more Senator Pearson about, you know, what is what's particularly complicated about that and whether our language is helpful and really providing some clarification. I would also just say, you know, this is the first time that we've been able to take up this bill with the Ag Committee and we're really grateful to be able to do so. And I think that this issue of defining, you know, indoor versus outdoor cultivation and putting some parameters around those is really one of the main cruxes of what we're trying to get at with um, looking at this more as an agricultural product. And frankly, myself, you know, I haven't been as deeply engaged in this issue for as many years as my colleagues here have, but this is one of the few areas where I have had conversations, um, for example, with Senator Polina and you know previously Senator Zuckerman um, around how the agricultural aspect of this could really be addressed. So I think this is something that's you know worth putting a little bit of effort into, um, if nothing else. Um, the see, I I don't know how how complicated Sears uh, Senator Sears is going to want us to get. Uh, make this into, but I would I would presume that on most small farms or places where they might get into grow, uh, producing hemp or, or cannabis, that a lot of these places have got a building that's you know thirty by fifty, and they could do inside growing uh, pretty easy. Whereas if they put this outside, it's got to be fenced in in a secure manner and and you've got to have, uh, you know, protective uh, devices to monitor and keep track of everything. And, and I was, personally, I was more interested in getting that number trying to get that number up to a size that a person could make some money at if you 
increase the size by 50%, go from 1,000 to 1,500, um, it, you know, it makes quite a difference in, in the end result, that, or it should, on how much money uh, you might be able to make off from being a little craft cultivator and, and uh, being able to use uh, 1,500 feet. But no one has mentioned yet how much, if everything worked perfect, how, how much you could do on 1,500 feet. I think we talked a, a little yesterday about 1,000 square feet. Any estimates on 1,500 feet? No. Nope. I would just quickly say, Senator, just to address what you said about the farms having like a facility that could convert to an indoor growing facility, that that's a, that's a significant undertaking. And a lot of farms, I think, would prefer just to do what they know how to do and, and grow outside in a, in a reasonable amount of space that makes sense for their farm. Um, a lot of people also don't have structures like that that, that are readily usable or, or adaptable to such a use. So I think that to answer your question on 1,500 square feet, I mean, if you take what Jeffrey just said about you know two to three, two to three feet between plants indoor and ten feet let's say between outdoor plants. Um, you know you get at least some some idea about the number of plants. Um, and I, I don't have any amount of production, but just to remind you that the numbers we came to were based on some surveys and studies of Vermont growers and cultivators currently. So it was meant to reflect what would what would be a reasonable livelihood for a small scale of producer. And that 1,000 square feet we suggested was specifically for indoor in that survey. Um, I, I don't know um, if, you, if you ran some quick, um, quick numbers, if, if you had a 30, a 30 by 50 to do uh, 15, you know, 1,500 square feet, um, you could go 10, roughly 10 plants, um, yeah, three plants long, which would be, um, and, uh, and then you could go five, um, five wide or four some, you know. So, sorry, I just want to offer some context on the, the what you asked for about the finances surrounding the different sizes and, and projected harvests. Uh, I just did yep. some quick back of the envelope oh. calculations. Um, so if you're growing a plant outdoors in Vermont, banking on a, a pound of usable product from that plant is a good goal um, that you can uh, reliably hit if you grow well. Um, it's not guaranteed, sometimes it's less, but you know that's, that'd be a successful harvest. Uh, outdoor product in a mature market, I think from what we see in other states reasonably could hit $800 a pound. That's if it's, you know, if, if you're growing high, higher quality for outdoor product in a mature market. So that is a $120,000 a year in, in revenue for a, a 1500 square foot outdoor plot. That doesn't include any costs the farmer is going to undertake, any labor costs, um, any water, any nutrients, any soil, any compost. Uh, any fencing, if that is in the bill, although we of course hope that that is removed as a requirement for outdoor grows. Um, if you're growing indoor and you get three poles a year from 1500 square feet, and if that is all flower, mind you, that, that some of that will have to be vegetative growth. So these could be very well be inflated numbers. Um, three harvests a year indoors. You know, you're talking about uh, significantly more revenue if that product fetches a higher price at market. If we take $1,800 a pound for a wholesale number, which again is generous in a mature market, um, you know, that you're looking at $810,000 of revenue a year as that size company. Once again, though, you have electricity costs, you have uh, equipment costs, things breaking all the time, you have labor costs. So you can definitely run a business, a profitable business at that scale indoors, but you can see the difference in the cash and the, and the revenue for an outdoor grow operating at 1500 square feet versus an indoor grow operating at 1500 square feet. And therein is why from a farmer's perspective, differentiating outdoor indoor is so important. But if, 
if we're silent on this, um, you know, you can do either. As long as if it isn't talked about, it's kind of silent. So if if you're uh, Graham just said, well, you know, he'd rather grow outdoors. Well, hell, if you could, if you could generate eight hundred thousand dollars compared to a hundred thousand dollars, you can build quite a building for a couple hundred thousand dollars. I would think. Um, I built a just built a, a forty by seventy building uh, for a hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and it's all insulated, lighted, heated. Uh, you know the whole nine yards. And totally. And I yeah. could add two levels to grow hemp or, or cannabis on if I put a floor in the middle. So, um, uh, you know, why would you want to fool around outdoors if, if, you know, unless you wanted to build a market? I don't know what the uh, thinking is. Well, you know, we got, uh, I believe it was 60% of respondents, growers that responded to VGA survey in the state plan on growing outdoors. I think it's also important to remember that extracts are a huge element of the industry and that extracted product is going to require a lot of supply going in, a, a lot of bulk supply, which outdoor is, you know, perfectly suited for. So when we're thinking about supporting a market, um, while yes, it certainly is incentivizing if you can afford to invest in indoor cultivation and go through uh, the hiccups and risks that come with indoor cultivation. It's a more fragile environment than growing outdoors. Um, you know, you can, uh, it's, it's definitely incentivizing for, for people to do that. But we, uh, of course, are, you know, like Senator Pearson said, I think there's a lot of good reason to try to encourage outdoor growing. And there is a lot of the market that will have demand for outdoor growing and uh, the scale that's, that's required to feed the supply in the state from an extraction product uh, perspective, uh, I think, you know, should just be reasonably considered when we're thinking about what, uh, what a farmer growing outdoors should be able to do uh, uh, in participating in the market, so. Uh, Chris? I would just say that, you know, it's important to remember these small licenses are, are held under a, a, a lighter regulatory touch. So it's, it's we're, we're, we are working hard to see if we can't introduce people into the universe. And I guess I have a question for Graham. It's too bad Maddie had to leave. But, um, you know, I was in meetings that maybe people didn't see where we had to fight like hell with other counterparts to get a thousand square feet of outdoor land used that's in current use to be uh, uh, maintained in current use, a thousand square feet. So the proposal that we will now, you would have us take back um, to, to make that 4,000 or whatever, 6,000 square feet and go, you know, it's, it's just not gonna happen. And, and so no. I, I get that that's not what you want us to tell you, um, but there will become a strategy point here of, do we have any bill at all? or do we ask for everything we want and uh, get nothing, or do we make some improvements and continue to advance this? And that, that's you know, not fair, and, and life is you know, filled with these choices in, in our jobs, and it's not fun for any of us, but that is the reality. Um, so my question, Graham, have you even once talked to Janet Ansel about increasing the threshold that she would be open uh, to uh, allow in current use, because that is what we're talking about at, as we talk about these changes in numbers. Even even shifting to 1,500 is going to be a battle with her, but at oh, least... It's, I it's, think we uh, could win that one, Chris. I think so, too, but but it won't, you know... Uh, she, and be, it's, uh, not, it's not just her, but she represents, uh, uh, you know, a lot of folks in the other... Well, obviously, she's powerful on the committee, but... You know, it's just a tricky dynamic that that I have to. It's part of my calculation as I um, try to think of the right move here. But Graham, have you? Do you have any indication that she's interested in being more flexible than she was five months ago? 
mean, as I said, you know, I reached out to Janet via email, I think a month ago or so after I left one of the times we spoke and you recommended I did. And I will remind you that you know, Janet Ansel is my personal representative, but I'm here in my professional capacity working at Royal Vermont. Um, so I understand that she has a particular positionality and power within the state house as well. She responded, like I said yesterday, that she wasn't in charge of agricultural issues until you told us yesterday that she was sort of critical in um, taking apart, you know, the, what you're talking about now. We didn't know specifically, you know, we can't see inside those committees of conference um, to see who does what at what point. She told me that she's not an agricultural committee. She only does money stuff and she doesn't, you know, doesn't well, deal with these types of issues. I'm current happy to use, talk with her. Current uses a money will... current use is a money thing, right? So this is where she gets yeah. her hooks into. I, I'm not trying to, you know, no, that's I hear just you. the reality yeah. that we're working in. Well, let me just complete my response. I, I will reach out to her. I have her phone number now and she's invited me to call her and I, I can have that conversation with her. But I think from our perspective as well, you know, represent what is the, the needs of our members and, and um, of the agricultural community. And I think to not differentiate between indoor and outdoor use and to not create a scale difference really makes very little sense in the ways that we, we've all put forth. And I think that, you know, it's, it's really unclear and there'd be clear inequity if we have a thousand square foot in law, but it's not differentiated and the CCB itself can't actually make a different craft license number for when they do differentiate because a thousand square feet is already in law and it's mandated. And that's a concern we have as well. And our strategy, I guess, is like I said, is just to, to push. We weren't involved in this conversation very much. We've been trying to be involved and we hope that this year, if that happens, that we can go into Janet's committee and, you know, and speak to her and say, you know, this, we're, we're representing our community. This is why this makes sense and have a conversation about it. But, you know, last year we really weren't able to be a part of that conversation. Uh, Josh, did you have something? Yeah, and I just wanted to add on to that, you know, that these policy positions are really coming from a perspective of advocating for, you know, what we see as the bulk of the Vermont industry, the local Vermont businesses, uh, the in-state owned businesses, especially. Um, and, you know, I think if Janet Ansel is going to strike these things from it, then we can do our job in advocating for why this makes policy sense uh, in her committee with that stuff in the bill because it's based on merit. So if we're here agreeing that these things make sense and that they would be right, but that Janet Ansel wouldn't approve of them, then I would ask that we let Janet Ansel not approve of them instead of not putting them in now because we don't think she's gonna approve of them. Um, well, I, I got a few more years in this business than <laughs> than you have, Josh. <laughs> I've been at this for 40 odd years passing stuff in Montpelier. And um, you, the art of compromise is probably the greatest asset that a legislator can have. And uh, you, you learn that you don't always get the biggest bite of the apple the first time you go to bite it, but yet you go back a year or two later and you get another bite and you get another bite. And whereas if, if you don't get that first little bite, you're never gonna get anything. You gotta start all over again. And, and um, you know, if, if we get going, if we can get that 1,500 feet, get a cap on the top so the big guys don't rob the market, and then if we find in a year or two that, hey, this is all working really slick, we could use, the little guys could use a little bit bigger plots, they could be outside. Uh, you know, I've never seen a bill that we couldn't amend. Uh, and that most of them get amended. And, um, and usually the second year, you always do a review of any major legislation that you passed the year or two before, just to make leveling out adjustments. And, and so the second time around, if things are going well, it's much easier to make those adjustments and move to where you really want to 
should have been in the first place, but it takes you a, a year or two to get there. And, and um, you know, it, it, I'd lot rather get a little bite at the apple than no apple at all. Um, uh, and G Janet's in a position where, hell, she could stop the whole show as being chair. <laughs> and, and there's no, no denying that, you know, that's just the way the rules and the way it works. Um, it's like Nancy Pelosi in Washington, almost. Um, you know, <laughs> um, but anyways, um, so, uh, other comments, um, other comments, uh, Jeffrey? Uh, if I may really fast, uh, Graham, um, just to, just to cap this, this topic, uh, from my perspective, um, to underscore what other states have told us uh, is basically that one to four ratio stands. So in terms of production and, and a livelihood, we should expect roughly 1,000 square feet inside is equivalent to ultimately at the end of the day, 4,000 square feet outside. So it would be, Vermont would be the exception if we uh, did not have uh, acknowledgement and differentiation between indoor and outdoor. Uh, so I just want to I just want to um, underscore that, and I, I do understand process, but I also think it's mindful to be you know aware of what the industry is doing and what other states have told us. Uh, Vermont is not leading this, uh, so there are lessons learned from other states. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. And Graham, I do believe you have uh, a follow up. Yeah. Well, I just want to um, speak to the. If I may, I just wanted to speak to the max production cap that you mentioned, Senator Starr. I think if you all put out a max production cap of, I think I heard you say around 30,000 square feet, without differentiating between indoor or outdoor light, it would be very hard for our coalition to support because we're recommending a max production cap of 10,000 square feet for indoor production and 40,000 for outdoor production. So if you put in 30,000 without differentiating, you're essentially tripling what we think is appropriate for indoor production being allowed. Um, and which makes it even more inequitable for outdoor production, which is the opposite of our intention. So that's a concern I'm expressing, and I think it's the same at the baseline. Um, and I don't know if it's possible simply to put in the, the ratio that, that Jeffrey is recommending as a, a standard in the law itself. But I'll, I'll leave it there. Well, I, I'm, I would just say I, I don't, I'm open to putting in larger uh, amounts for outdoor and the commensurate change to current use that's that's fine with me I, I think it's a real roll of the dice but um that doesn't bother me if uh you know if if you're comfortable with the gamble uh that we don't get anything i'll follow your lead i mean if i may chris uh, uh senator pearson if it would help uh we do have uh sister organizations in other states we can bring policy directors to these conversations if it would be helpful with uh, uh, Ansel uh, and others who can speak to this indoor outdoor differentiation that you know they've been operating under for several years. Um, but we're we're, we, we're welcome to bring those resources if that's helpful uh, from other states. Well, it's not for me to say what's helpful with her. She's an opponent of this. You know, you guys, <laughs> it's an inconvenient reality that, that we face that has held us back for years, okay? I mean, I've been pushing this when I was in the House in 2014. I forced a floor vote on this. She was opposed. I mean, you don't like the reality. I don't like the reality. I, I But that's that's just what we're dealing with. So if you want to say to Janet, you're gonna. We're gonna now make you say that 4,500 uh, square feet of outdoor is part of current use. Go for it. You guys make that call, and, and I'll back you up. I think it's yeah, the wrong if, strategy, and I think you'll get zero bill. But that's your choice. If you go 1,500 indoor, that's 6,000. That's uh, 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 outside. I mean, hell. It won't cut it. You can't. Uh, that's a uh, you know pushing. That'd be pushing an acre, I believe, and they aren't gonna buy that. Um, but 
hey, uh, yeah, you know, I got some people that want to grow this stuff. I am gonna personally a freaking dog in the fight. So, and you know, I I don't even know if I've I don't think I've ever voted for this be, in the first place because I felt that we had enough drugs floating around out there without legalizing another one to uh, pump into whoever. Then I have to rehabilitate everybody. I mean, yeah. But anyhow, uh, if uh, I, I don't know. I, Bobby? Uh, Bobby? It's uh, Anthony. <laughs> oh, your picture. Okay. Yeah, go, something, go. Something's, something's weird with my iPad. My, I can't seem to get my video on. I've, I've been listening, though, to this whole conversation. Um, I've just also been dealing with some semi-emergency stuff going on in my other committee, but I just wanted to chime in and say that I think that we all well should take to heart what Christopher and others have been saying about the difficulty of moving this bill forward at this point. It's kind of an inconvenient truth that we have to deal with. It's that it's not really up to us to pass the bill that we want to pass. It's what we can pass. I think that the idea of differentiating the indoor and outdoor, we could do that and maybe in a simple way, given what Michelle gave us, where we just say 30,000 is, is outside, 10,000 is inside or something like that. But I guess all I'm saying is, you know, we're, we're down to the wire here and we've been talking about this bill for five years and we're coming pretty close to like having to stop the conversation and bite the bullet and say what we want to do. And I would just caution us to try to come up with something that is doable because there are people who would rather just see the bill die on the vine, and I would hate to see that happen. Um, Sorry, I can't see you all. You, I can see you, but you can't see me. Oh, yeah, you can see that? Yeah, I see that. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know. Uh, is, is but I think a... at this point in time, I think at this point in time, it's really important to keep it relatively simple. I mean, the I committee got this bill. The I committee got the bill just the other day for the first time, first time ever, which is unfortunate. But I don't think we can afford to have these like long, winding conversations about what we really hope to have because we're basically down to have another. We have like an hour to like work this out between today and tomorrow. We just don't have the time or the ability to like work it too much more. Well, I thought it was. One to four, Anthony, not one to three. Well, no, sure, whatever. Your... Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I, whatever, whatever works. Well, whatever works. You, you want to? I mean, we have numbers that that kind of support. I thought one to four. Yeah. If you grow inside, you you have ten thousand feet. But if you grow outside you could should be able to go 40,000 feet and that's what other states have done and what has worked is I think am I right on that guys sorry with me to so, correct, correct uh California Oregon Maine there there are several of the more agrarian leaning states and territories of states that have adopted that, that sort of ratio. In fact, there are other parts of Oregon that have a five to one. So it, it varies, but we thought a four to one was appropriate for Vermont. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, if anybody wants to, uh, the committee members, any of you want to make a suggestion or a motion to uh, propose that in, um, in then if it carries, we'll have uh, Michelle uh, do the number and do add that to the um, to the proposal that we're going to send to Sears. So I, I, more than just the concept, though, when we when Michelle and I spent about half an hour about it last night trying to figure out how to do it simply, it wasn't simple. So. Um, so it's it's not just the concept i think you know do we want to say you know here's the small end indoor here's the big end indoor the board can figure out a commensurate that's roughly four to one relationship for outdoor is it you know do we want to express it as a uh, empowering them to do that 
Do we want to direct them to do that? I think they're already empowered, uh, but but I think we could probably make that more plain. Um, how do you want to deal with the tax implications? Should there be a commensurate fee adjustment, or is it you know in this tier the fee is X and you're indoor or outdoor at those? There are a lot of questions to unpack, and as Sam Polina says, you know we got 12 minutes now. Uh, no, and no lawyer to help us. So that, that yeah, was Chris, that's do we why we solve all those issues. I mean, the whole beautiful part of this process is we can look at maybe just the quick agricultural issues and, and, and push it along. I just, you know, I, I think you keep it. I, I guess where I am is let's get to a place where we can move it and let the process continue to play out. Well, so what does that mean? I would just get the thing out of our committee with, you know, a slight adjustments like your amendment or, or something out to move it. I mean, I don't, I don't have a dog in this fight. Like Bobby said, I'm just honestly not that 100% that interested in the topic and don't want to spend that much time on it, but also don't want to kill it. We could just say, since we're only writing a memo back, yeah, you're some of the language. We also encourage you to figure out some way to direct the board to acknowledge that outdoor grows should be bigger. We could do my that. My only dog in this fight is I don't want our growers, our farmer growers, to end up like our dairy guys. <laughs> you know, if we can I, help, I just don't think we're going to figure that out in a day or two, Bobby. That's my thought is, you know, that's a lot. No, time. but if we cap the damn size that somebody can get to be, we've taken care of that. And, and there's plenty of money at where we capped it for anybody to be able to survive and, and do okay, but it allows more growers because if you let one guy grow four acres, I mean, just think of the number of little guys you're bumping out of the way. And then they corner the market, they start selling cheaper and they crowd the little guys more and the little guys more, and pretty soon, the big guys have got the whole, the whole show. I'm I'm fine putting that cap in. I, I think again, it has a long ways to go. But if, if that's a recommendation here, I can live with that. Me too. I don't much care about the minimum. I don't. I don't see that. That who cares? Um, but the max. Yeah, I think the max is way more important. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to Chris's question about the uh, current use, but I don't know that that's our business here. I mean, we, I, I don't know. Well, that's a whole nother fight. And what the hell, if it is taken out, what's a big deal on a little plot 30 by 50? I mean, you're, it isn't gonna cost the farmer 20 bucks. I mean, more a year in taxes. I. I mean, I don't know why there's a big fight over that anyways. If, you know, we aren't talking about big bucks here. Um, I think it's wrapped up in whether or not it's considered agriculture and the, you know, some of those questions, but uh, the Senate well, has historically gotten its way on that one. It's certainly, uh, it's certainly agriculture, but, but say, you know, you, how, how long are you going to argue over the change in your pocket if somebody's stealing the dollar bills out your back pocket? You know, uh, you, you want to <laughs> you be able to count here a little bit. So we'll, we'll try to wrap this up tomorrow then, Mr. Chair. What do you want to do? Uh, well, as soon as we can get Michelle going, if um, we'll, we'll, talk to her about um, you know these numbers and put it into a, a form that we can send to Sears. Yeah, we'll wrap it up in the morning. We're kind of lucky because one of the one of the members of Senate Judiciary is not here today, uh, Senator White. So they won't be taking a vote on it until tomorrow anyway. Oh, good. And of course May they're I a morning committee. So yeah, Josh, you had a question um uh graham if you want to jump in then i can go after oh, you graham's ahead 
Oh, yeah, he's got his little yellow hand up. We just go like this so I can really see the hand. Uh, go ahead, Graham. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, just in light of you asking for recommendations and describing the limitations that you're facing, if you're just writing a memo to Senate Judiciary and that's what you're, you're sending, um, I think that one to four ratio is important from our perspective. And when you speak to the cap being important to you, I think, as I said, like we would not support a cap unless it was articulated via indoor or outdoor because we would see it as potentially making it more inequitable for outdoor producers if, if it was just stated that 30,000 square feet, for example, was the cap without stating that that was for outdoor production explicitly. So if you're just writing a memo, I think those are the, the most important things for us. If you want to do the floor and the ceiling and just the indoor-outdoor ratios, and I, I understand the the directive for us to to compromise and to consider that more. And I would just remind the committee too that we originally had like five or six pages of proposed amendments, including our racial equity amendments. They were almost 20 pages or more than 20 pages. Um, and this is our only opportunity we've ever had to speak to an actual committee on this. So we do appreciate it. We understand your limitations. Um, we have really tried to compromise and really tried to isolate and you know, prioritize what we're speaking with you about. And I think those are recommendations that I think could go to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, one to four indoor, outdoor, um, and no cap, did I hear you say, Graham? Well, if the- No, I think- Sorry. I was just gonna say, we support the cap uh, at, the, at the ratio of one to four, 10,000 feet indoors and 40,000 feet outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Josh. Yeah, I just wanted to call out one thing that it sounded like we had common ground around a, a few minutes ago, uh, which is reducing the cap for indoor grow down to 10,000 square feet, um, which is uh, our recommendation and I think more appropriate even going off of Massachusetts, their population is about 10 times larger than us. So if 30,000 square feet was one third 10,000 square feet would be one tenth, and that's in line with the population difference between the two states. Um, so, and then if so, if it was 10,000 square feet indoor cap with uh, outdoor grows being allowed to be four times larger than indoor grows, that would be quite simple language that achieved the differentiation between outdoor and indoor and set those caps. And I do appreciate um, this committee being uh, so concerned about uh, capping the production and protecting the small farmers because uh, I certainly, for one, am in agreement that that's very important. So I want to express uh, you know, that acknowledgement. Uh, just, just to follow up on that, a little bit of industry insight. Uh, we, I agree the 10,000 indoor cap is what we should be reaching. Uh, Chair Star, in the industry, when you get into the 30,000 square foot for indoor cultivation, that's when you get into the factory farm type activity, which we're trying to avoid in the state. That is the large sort of output of cannabis indoor. That's that 30,000. That's what we're trying to avoid. Let's cap that at 10,000. Uh, I just want to put it out there. That's what the industry sees. So 10, 10 inside 40, yeah, 10, 40, yeah, one to four. Yeah. Um, committee, anything else that you'd like to add or talk about? Um, I, uh, I, I would just say I'm not convinced 10 is the right number. Um, so but we'll talk about, we'll talk about that. Sure. Um, and, uh, looking for my schedule for tomorrow. Um, oh. Um, yeah, we've got um, just a couple of things right at nine o'clock, and then we'll we'll try to get this issue wrapped up, um, you know, by mid morning, and get 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 it down to um, Senator Sears. Um, if we could get hold of Michelle later today, maybe we could get her to draft, start drafting up, you know, some language once we chat again. Um, so, um, anything else uh, for this morning? 
Good, everybody. Um, well, thanks guys for showing back up today. Uh, I don't know if we're going to wear that soil all out uh, plowing it here. Uh, we may not be able to even grow any cannabis if we keep plowing the dirt. We're going to ruin it. <laughs> uh, but no, I think we made, um, you know, we're, we're making some headway and, and hopefully um, it'll help, uh, help our small growers and our regular growers. And, and um, so if you want to punch back in, you know, if you're around and want to uh, get in tomorrow morning, um, uh, you know, that's great. Um, we should be, we should be able to be on to this by 9.30, uh, well, quarter to 10 maybe. So with that, uh, if there's no other business, I'll adjourn the meeting and um, thank you again for you guys for your time and, and uh, your help and, and we'll uh, hopefully see you tomorrow. Thanks, see, you, see you other guys on. Thank you.